Hi, I'm Nate Flax. I'm Noah Longworth McGuire. And, and this, this is Talking, Talking Lion. Lion. Talking Lion is a podcast focused on artist to artist conversations. We're primarily artists, a duo called Sleeping Lion. And throughout our career as songwriters and producers, we've had the opportunity to work with so many incredible rising artists. Talking Lion is about hitting record on the conversations we've had with our musical friends and collaborators to get a glimpse into what their life's been like and where it's going. A few reminders before we start. Firstly, we now have a Patreon for fans of the show to show their support and help keep the show going. As a Patreon subscriber, not only will you earn rewards, but you'll also gain exclusive access to a chat room in our Discord server. Here you can talk with us and even suggest questions for our guests. Go to patreon.com slash talking lion to subscribe. We appreciate your support. As we mentioned, we also have a Discord server that's become a sort of community hub for Sleeping Lion and Talking Lion. We're very active on there and very eager to talk to you about who you are on the show and how you feel about the new episodes, as well as just talking about life. So yeah, come through and you can talk with us. You can make some new friends, share your art, and share your memes. Go to sleepinglionmusic.com slash discord to join our server. We hope to see you there. Lastly, our face is on a shirt. We have shirts now for Talking Lion with our faces on them. If you want to wear us on your shirt, buy a shirt. It helps support the show and it shows your friends that you like Sleeping Lion and Talking Lion. You can find these shirts on our website, sleepinglionmusic.com slash store. Pro tip, Patreon supporters of the honorary lion tier or higher will get a free shirt. Now back to the show. We recorded this chat with our friend Alex Engelberg. We first connected with Alex on TikTok, but he recently visited us in Los Angeles and we got a chance to get to know each other in real life. While we recorded this chat remotely, it's a continuation of the conversations we were having while we were hanging out in person. So, without further ado, I'm Alex Engelberg and this is Talking Lion. Hey. Hello. Hi. How's it going, man? Good. We miss you already. <laughs> yeah, I miss you already. But how are you doing, man? What's been new? Uh, I'm good. I'm just chilling, making some TikToks sometimes. I saw I saw your uh, your family did a TikTok recently. Yeah, I, uh, I did a family reveal first time. <laughs> nice. Um, I had my mom on one video uh, where I did the Kira Kosser in December re- remix. Right, uh, right, And right. I had my mom on the banjo. Uh, which was fun. She was very uh, on board with that. Uh, and then, yeah, I think I, I saw this video that uh, that Melinda had made um, where she was singing uh, that, that song from the Bo Burnham special, All Eyes on Me. All and, Eyes on uh, Me, yeah. And I was like, this is amazing. And I want to, I need to like add something on this at first. And I was thinking like, I'm, I'm about to like for unrelated reasons, I'm about to drive over to my family's house later tonight. <laughs> and so I was like, at first I was like, ooh, it'd be cool if I maybe like played a grand piano or something on top of this. Um, but then I was like, wait, 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 hold on a second. If I'm near my family, we can just all just like sing harmony to this. Uh, and that's a much that. better idea. And they were on board. So Well, it's funny you mentioned uh, Kira's uh, song, because I think that that was m- maybe how, like you probably came up on our like for you page a couple times, but I think that we like actually met you uh, or like first sort of like interacted mm-hmm. with you because of Kira, because Kira was doing her like December remix stuff, mm-hmm. and you did an awesome an awesome one, and then we like followed you on on TikTok, and then nice. like uh, and followed you on uh, on Twitter, and then Charlie knew you, and then we yeah. all like at, at one point we we hadn't interacted, but everybody we were interacting with <laughs> knew you. <laughs> you were like the yeah. community organizer. That was really when when you. Yeah, and you sort of indicated that when I was started talking to you, and that was very surprising to me because <laughs> I'm not used to being notable. <laughs> when you came by and we like all got breakfast, that was one of the things that like really struck me was like I thought you were aware of like how many threads you wound up connecting <laughs> yeah, in our little TikTok universe, but you weren't aware. <laughs> I think it's these. also that you exist in the perfect intersection of our niche of stuff yeah. that we enjoy on TikTok. <laughs> I so, really like, do of course, feel the like the algorithm was going to deliver. Yeah, I, I really did feel like I sort of kind of stumbled multiple steps into sort of your whole like friend group. And it's very, it's awesome. <laughs> right. I love hanging out with you No, guys. it's great. Uh, it's because we're all disciples of Bill Wirtz. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I love, I love your, the, the video where uh, we're just like uh, about Bill Wirtz's style and you're just like, no. People are always telling us, hey, you sound like Bill Wirtz. And you should stop stealing his style. And we always say, no. <laughs> no. 
No. <laughs> that was pretty fun to make with uh that was with Chonky official, right? Yeah. 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 She's incredible, by the way. Shout out to Chunky. Yeah, I started following her after that video. I just, <laughs> I, I don't know, I appreciate it. Because I, I think that what's really interesting is that Bill Wirtz had, like pre-TikTok, such a profound effect on mm. a lot of creatives. And I, I've been trying to put my finger down on why, but I think other than it being like in, just incredible musicianship and, you know, and and really funny, I think Bill Wirtz does a phenomenal job of having such a distinctive voice as a producer and as a writer. And, and even though it's like so left field, mm. I think that like we can all connect with like wanting to have a voice as a producer and a writer, yeah. you know, having a mm-hmm. voice in like the, the the stuff that we make. So I think that's why like some, some of my favorite pop people will cite Bill Wirtz as an yeah. influence because of how I think authentic to his style and how consistent in his yeah, style. Yeah, I mean, Bill Wirtz is. is one of the strongest brands around. Like, yeah, it's, he's an, very it's, consistent. it's absolutely undeniable. Well, he's very, he's very inconsistent in like, like what he talks about and like he's so random and that's kind of his thing, but he also manages to be really consistent in like the brand, the aesthetic. And I think in a lot of ways, like what I love is that he'll take an idea and then just follow the thread of the idea. Like there's a, there's a clear like A to B to C of like what he's doing, which I think has been a huge influence of like some of the more straight down the middle folk stuff that that I do of just following where the song goes. Well, but like, yeah. Um, he, he talked about this in his genius interview, which I love that he has a genius interview <laughs> yeah. for Nonsense Helens is about to explode. <laughs> yeah. Where he ta- he references A Hard Rain is Gonna Fall by Bob Dylan as a reference for the bridge of that song. And he talks about how he feels like the Bob Dylan song was sort of written, uh, I forget if he said sideways, or it, it was written diagonally, yeah. that, that huh. each idea kind of moves not linearly, that. but sideways into each other. And I feel like that that's how Bob Dylan wrote. There's there's Allen Ginsberg was a huge fan of that song in particular and felt like he even said to something like the torch has been passed when he heard that song, mm-hmm. that it was almost an extension of his style. And now you have this thread of Allen Ginsberg to Bob Dylan to Bill Wirtz, <laughs> which I think like uh, on its face seems absurd, but makes a very deep kind of sense to me. Diagonally. Diagonally, exactly. Huh. But that was the thing that, like, I don't know, that we first sort of connected. Not the, uh, you know, the the Bill Wirtz rip, as you guys put it in in your video, yeah. but just like the idea that you know everything that you work on um, in in TikTok land sounds like you, and so it's like mm. it's it was very inspiring to us, you know, and, and you and Charlie and everybody like th- that you guys found a distinctive style in what you do, you know, uh, a Thank kind you. of like I Engelbergian flavor. You I'm know? surprised <laughs> that I have a consistent Engelbergian flavor because I thought that I was too like all over the map and not actually like honing in on it on a particular thing like I don't have a specific um brand like I um after I got the the TikTok playlists feature which I don't know <laughs> why that's being rolled out so inconsistently but I somehow managed I love, to get it by the way I love your Twitter because you are a software guy so you're like you're like why the fuck are they rolling out this thing now yeah. like this <laughs> Yeah, and it's like as software engineers, it's sort of bad form to sort of like kibitz on like other people's software practices. But also, when something is just like there's things that are going on in TikTok and how they roll out the app that just feel like such a almost like a red flag to me in terms of like how they're approaching this, and I just can't <laughs> I can't help but just like call it out. Um, no, I I, it, I appreciate it just, that a, it a lot. It helps me vent a little bit, and it, it it's cathartic for me as a creator when I can like feel like I know what I'm talking about on the actual back end part of it. <laughs> I, I completely relate to that on a on a sound level. Like whenever I hear a podcast where like the like the actual audio quality or like the edit is really really weird, I'll want to DM and be like, "Hey, like I can edit your thing," but it's also super bad form to be like, "Hey, mm-hmm. can I do can I do this better?" And then of course, you know, a month later, they're like looking for audio editors. I'm like, I could have DM them. <laughs> yeah, in software in the software community, um, especially the sort of like the ops DevOps community, um, there's this uh, there's this term called hug ops, um, and and there's a, a like hashtag hug ops, which is is this idea that like. If some software or platform that you use, like a popular website or something, goes down and it's like offline or something, then it's tempting to just go on and like trash the developers being like, how could you have let this happen? You're terrible. You're awful. Screw you guys. But really like 
there's probably just so many factors that went into this. There's like, and like there, accidents happen all the time. People accidentally do stuff that, or, or like whole teams of people will lead down kind of a series of accidents that kind of result in the systemic risk that makes the app eventually go down. And so really what you should be doing is offering empathy uh, and saying like, almost like giving them a hug and saying like, hey, I feel you, you know, shout out to all the engineers that are probably like working overtime to get this app back online. I feel that. And so people will say hashtag hug ups sort of in earnest. I, I love that. I've, I've said on the podcast multiple times that I feel like there are certain like communities or industries that are a lot more sort of empathetic and understanding or at least just like more verbally um like adept than the music industry because I feel like because artists are sort of these figureheads that they get flack for fucking everything yeah. and it's just so hard and like and I and I'm always just sort of like you need to like follow some of the threads and sure there are definitely people who like want to make their money yeah and, I think and, art, and artists as figureheads it's just like you're you're trying to figure out why they do what they do yeah, yeah. and I mean, like most people don't know how the sausage gets made so they they yeah. just see a high price tag and they go that's bad you're bad yeah if you see that and and if you do trace it back and you see that the problem is that there is somebody in power that is abusing their power, then you should call it out. Like, we need right. to be calling that stuff out. Like, you know, the music industry is, like, very problematic, actually. So I feel like actually, you know, complaining about the end consumer experience can be actually useful if you can actually clarify that, like, hey, so there's this, it's not the artist's fault, but, like, this is kind of fucked, though. <laughs> well, and that's, and that's the thing is that, like, you know, in my head, it's a miracle that any app exists Mm. And without crashing at any point, because just like the, the amount of volume, like when you think yeah. of something like TikTok, where it's just like literally like years worth of content every second is being uploaded. Yeah, I actually don't um, understand how that's like techno like technologically possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or just, you know, like like 3D animation. Right. And how, you know, every frame has to be like figured out through a render farm. Mm. You know, and then we're just like, yeah, and you know, we really didn't like that one shot. I feel right. like there was a like a John Mulaney quote, and I don't, I don't think it was even in his special, but it was some kind of obscure place where he said this, so I can't actually remember where, but I'm pretty sure it was him saying something about how like it's so weird how many movie critics there are and how we never acknowledge just how impressive it is that literally any movie gets made. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. Right. Exactly. Like, like, just the term "bad movie" doesn't even really make sense <laughs> when you think about what he. It's how, kind of like yeah. pizza in that way, where it's just like it's impressive that you made yeah, this. Like, and, I and love you can all find pizza. a level, a baseline <laughs> level of appreciation for it for, for yes, any movie. Exactly. No matter how bad it is. Well, then you know, and then the 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 irony is that there is this sort of bell curve because on the one hand, like, like in the history of film, you have you have auteurs, which like because they have their hands on everything, you have a consistent movie and you have all the pieces in place because they have their hands on the wheel. But also like auteur theory is inherently a little bit like problematic and misogynistic um, mm -hmm. because it's, you know, the history of film is, is mm -hmm. you know, a lot of male directors or a lot of just like uh, blank checks and ego posturing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's problematic. But then on the other side, like when you get a, a major studio that is able to like, like I watched a video on just the logistics of how, how Endgame was made. Mm. It was a video essay <laughs> oh, about wow. not about like anything, but literally about like how they managed to figure out like location scouting, mm. handling local governments, wow. and you know f for the one scene that took place in, in um like Scotland or Ireland or something. Right. The thing is, when you have logistics at that scale, you know there's all these things, but of course, in order for that to happen, it needs to be more corporate, which is also problematic. Right. And mm. also has comes with its own problems because you know it's built on on corporate exploitation. Et cetera, et cetera. So you've got like, there is no good way to make a movie unless it's like a one camera thing in your bedroom. Um, and then it's probably not going to be that good. And then it's probably not going to be that good. Yeah. <laughs> unless it's inside by Boberna. <laughs> unless it's yeah. inside by Boberna. <laughs> And then, but then you sell it to Netflix, and then where are you? And then you know? it's in theaters, and you make a bunch of money off of it. Yeah. Because it's a TikTok trend. I got that funny feeling right now, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Anyway, all this to say, uh, I agree with you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Engelbergian flavor. Yes. Also, going back to the the Bill Wirtz subject, um, I thought it was really interesting how you talked about like how you gravitated to his style. I, I love Bill Wirtz, by the way. Like biggest fan of him. 
And uh, first video I think I saw of his was, uh, oh, hi, thanks for checking in. I'm still a piece of garbage. Uh, <laughs> still a piece of garbage. And I think, you know, I think I've seen everything else he's done at some point. But I feel like a lot of people have only seen that one video he's made and it shows uh, because <laughs> everyone thinks that the Bill Wirtz style is singing relatable sentences over like right. vintage chords. But that's literally the only video he's made that does that. But um, yeah, the first because the first thing I saw was New Canaan. Oh you yeah, know, yeah. Like, uh, I'm yeah. going to New Canaan, Pennsylvania. Yeah, it's just a good song. It's a, yeah. It is a good song. And I after I discovered New Canaan and like all the sort of like full length singles that he's released on Spotify and stuff, yeah. and that became like kind of my soundtrack to like going to work and stuff. And I think what what I found really interesting about him is that so for me personally, I'm not really a lyrics guy and just in general. And like when I'm listening to music. When the lyrics don't really like is I don't really process the lyrics as sort of part of the like experience and it, the aesthetic and the production are what hit me the hardest. And so I felt like Bill Wirtz was like, like it was so clear that he he was he was kind of prioritizing the instrumentation and kind of the aesthetic feel of the singing but then the actual lyrical content was completely meaningless but what's funny is that like uh, you know and we actually when when you came by and we wrote together i i went on a whole rant about how much i love lyrics and how mm-hmm. you know it is important to listen listen for yeah. lyrical content and what i do love about bill Ward's lyrics mm-hmm. is even though they are somewhat nonsensical they are still somehow like dripping in sincerity yeah like yes i yeah you know, there's he's some, not like he, it's not comedy like he's not like just th- trying to think of the s- most meaningless stuff to be silly. He's just like, he's just kind of letting his brain just come up with words that happen to mean something to him in the moment and then just going with it. But then you take a song like Mount St. Helen or mm-hmm. you take a song like Airport Terminal um, or even like Long, Long, Long Journey, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. It's like, I came here to lose, but I still might win. Yeah. You know? Um, or even, uh, even he like, there's that whole section in one of the songs where he's like, I went on a podcast to talk about my feelings, but I couldn't remember like anything at all or before something the, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And it, he went on the H3H3 and talked about, he's talked about in other for, like forums, how he had a really time, really had had a really hard time on that podcast, and doesn't want to do it again. Yeah, basically. yeah. Watch it. I, I like, didn't hear. I didn't see that actually. What he was talking, the retrospective of him on the podcast. But I will say, watching that interview made me really uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, because because everybody wanted to ask about like history of the world and and you know sort of put him in this box of like, oh, this sort of like one-off comedy thing. It's like, no, I made, you know, but he's like, no, I made videos like every day, you know, for years. Yeah. Um, the other thing about Bill Wirtz that I think is worth talking about is how how much he's he's been able to have a career on entirely his own terms. On his own mm. terms. Like, like in, in f- to the, to not, maybe not quite the level, but in the same vein as like Frank Ocean or Lord that like, he has curated such a strong sense of aesthetic and such a such a devoted fan base because his content is inherently so quality that people will mm. wait nine <laughs> or ten months or, yeah. or, or a, year a year plus for a piece of yeah. content. He's not playing the rat race. He's not he he has circumvented the rat race of putting out content every day, even though that's how he started on Vine. But that was less about him engaging with the social media, and more, yeah, about, yeah, he, he, and more he, about him. Yeah, learning he, he to felt like craft. it was important to him to put out that frequently not to like his fans uh yeah and uh one thing that i feel like is almost kind of like scary about him in terms of like it's so intimidating that someone could be like this uh that i feel like is apparent from watching his interviews is that like it seems apparent to me that if if he had zero fans instead of like many millions of fans he would have made the exact same sequence of content at the times that he put it out like like it, it seems like he he sort of planned to just make content forever until somebody noticed, basically. And he was right. And even when people started following him, that never actually became an input into his like creative process, even. It's insane to think about the theoretical world in which Bill Wirtz just keeps going on completely unknown and just keeps making all that stuff. <laughs> and that's why I think his songs have so much sincerity because he he did feel like at one point it was like a candid space. Where do you think you fall on that spectrum of uh, you know? creating content for the platform versus creating content for yourself. Because yeah. you also, and, and to, to sort of piggyback on that, and I also want to ask on top of that, mm-hmm. and what have you learned by the frequency of making something for a platform? Because oh, as see, we yeah. said, you know, Bill Wirtz does it, you know, so much. But one of the things that you really like 
put your foot down on when we first hung mm. out was you're like, I'm not like an artist. Like I, mm. I love, I'm a musician. I love making things, but like, I don't, you know, I'm not doing the Spotify thing. I'm not part of that yeah. sort of rat race. Like yeah. I'm not, I'm not an artist. I'm a creator or something like that was sort of how you put it. Yeah. Um, you are a can of soup. I, I, I am a can of soup. Hashtag I'm a can of soup. I'm a can of soup. I have the only videos on that hashtag. <laughs> but yeah, I think I'm I feel very I don't identify at all really with what we just talked about with Bill Wirtz about how he just puts stuff out with, without caring about what people think about it. Like I really really care what people think about what I make. So like <laughs> right. I I do rely on sort of external validation, but I also only make things that I'm really excited about making. And so that those two factors combined make me not post very often at all <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, because I only put out because I, I'll have ideas that I'm really excited about, but I might not do because I don't think that like that many people are going to like them except me or I'll just put it on my spam account or something just for fun. But also like, you know, so there will be some trend or something that like all the musicians are doing this trend where they sing this riff or something. Um, and I don't personally find that interesting enough to want to participate. So I just don't, uh, <laughs> even though like, I don't know, it might get me more views to just like put, put out something that like follows this pattern. I just like, don't really feel like it. So I just don't. Well, what is funny though, is that like, I think that the video that made me want to like just DM you and like be friends was your airport jingle video. <laughs> Please stand clear. The doors are closing. Next stop, S gates. Remain on board for A and B gates. Doors closing. Please stand clear. The doors are closing. Please stand clear and hold on for departure. Welcome aboard the plane train. Please hold on. This train is departing. That was so insane. So the story behind that yeah. was... <laughs> So, I mean, I like airport jingles. I, I don't know why, but I just, I think there were only like a couple that I actually had like memorized. Like I couldn't have, I did have to do a little bit of like looking stuff up to make that video. But um, the, there was this one, uh, one of the ones in that video, I think was the Atlanta Sky Train, not the plane train, but the Sky Train, <laughs> which is just the <laughs> train that takes you from the airport to like the rent-a-car place. Uh, wow. And because I have I have some extended family that live in Atlanta, so I I have as a child that sound kind of I latched onto that and got baked into my brain. So, um uh, I kept, kept remembering that and then at some point at a young age I kind of like started playing it on the piano. Turns out I think that's the exact same sound effect that eBay uses uh, when, you get, oh my God. when you get a notification. I didn't realize that until like after I posted this someone was like, "Hey, is that the eBay sound?" I was like, "Huh." Yeah, this is just the same sound effect that two different companies, I guess, decided to like use. But anyway, huh. so um, I don't know. I thought I, I was just recently thinking about it. I was like, it would make some really stupid content if I just like m did like a bunch of or I, I, I started by posting just on my Instagram story um, just because I don't know. I was motivated to just put it on my Instagram story. I just made a video of me saying like, hello, this is my impression of the jingle of the Atlanta Skytrain. And then I played it and I posted that. And then my friend, my, my friend Jen, who who is from Denver, but uh, uh, now lives in Seattle, uh, she she like replied to the story saying like, oh, my God, you have to do the Denver airport jingle. Well, so that was the one <laughs> that I like immediately connected to. because yeah. I told you because of like a scheduling error in my family, mm. I accidentally had to spend 24 hours in Denver <laughs> International Airport. Oh like I literally was like, you know, I, I was and, documenting it. There was like, ter it was oh like Tom God. Hanks's terminal. And so when you played the Denver one, I'm like, I had War like, flashbacks. This, this sound still haunts me. Yeah. <laughs> that also that jingle is like objectively stupid. It's like really it's, funny. <laughs> but it's like so good. Yeah. It's got the little piano riff. It's like, it's like so, the it's piano. so out of pocket. Um, and so, so my friend said, oh my God, you have to do the Denver airport jingle. This is all on my Instagram story. It hasn't even hit TikTok yet. Uh, and I was like, right, so I've never, I've never, I think I've been to Denver airport or something, but I've never, don't remember that. Uh, but I looked it up because it's so iconic that someone had made a YouTube video with that jingle in it. I was like, what the heck? And so I was like, all right, great. I, I'm, I'm committed to this bit. So I post another Instagram story saying like, hello, this is my impression of the jingle in the Denver international <laughs> airport. 
uh, and I've played that. And then I and then I was like, all right, comedy comes in threes or more than three. So I got to keep going this. I only have two. So I just I, I went I found a Wikipedia article that was like uh, like list of airports with people movers in them. It didn't say whether they had jingles or not, but at least I had a list to work with from there. So I started <laughs> going on the YouTube. And fortunately, there are enough um, like diehard transit enthusiasts out there that there right. that there's like at least one YouTube video of somebody just like riding every train. Oh, my God. And so I found I would go look at e- each airport and I would like listen for the jingle. So that's how I figured out that I think like JFK had one. Uh, yep. I had, I don't think I've ever been or I've been there, but I haven't heard that jingle. So, but I looked it up and I was like, all right, that's a thing. So that I can I can use that. So I did that, and I was like, I'm definitely sure that SeaTac Airport, which is where I live, uh, has one. And so I looked that up because I didn't quite remember, but I was like, oh yeah, yeah, there there it is. Very very nostalgic. So I just kept post. I posted five Instagram stories that were just like, this is my impression. I I I I had a whole prelude for each one where I said, this is my impression of this jingle. And I was cracking myself up and I don't know if anyone else was like enjoying it, but I, I just committed to that bit. And then like the next day I was like, I realized I just spent so much effort making these Instagram stories. I could just kind of recycle this as TikTok content. So I literally took all those Instagram stories and then chopped <laughs> off, chopped off the like preludes where I was saying w- like what I was doing. And then I just tr- uh, com- montaged it into a, Made TikTok. a list of them. Uh, yeah. And, and, then, and then formulated it like a top five. Um, so that it felt more TikToky, and then that blew up. I was like, "Why?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I I, th- I think it's because there are the enthusiasts out there. Also, I'll just like your ear for them is really funny. I remember when you like when you came to visit us, you like burst into our studio. You were like, "There's a minor second on the bus." <laughs> uh, yeah, on the and, so I realized I, I, it wasn't even intentional. I think that the so so this it wasn't on the bus. It was in the underground like metro train. And it that's not even like a thing. It's just that particular train was broken. So there were like, oh my god! I was I happened to be sitting kind of like so that I can hear the jingle being played from two adjacent cars on the same train, and they were one uh. of them had just gone out of tune. So it was playing a minor second. I think. I think well, that's you what sent happened. me the video. You sent me the video yeah. of like you, you uh. like <laughs> interacting with this with this minor second, which uh, everybody who's listens to the podcast is is has been getting a consistent stream of education on perfect pitch because we've had <laughs> Stella Cole. Right. Right. Ashley, oh, you, yes. you have perfect pitch as well. Um, pitch. Yeah, you 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 definitely have an ear out for that. For I, that I, thing, I think that know? I think my my enthusiasm, like I don't consider myself that much. I, I love you know public transit. I think we need more of it, but I wouldn't necessarily call myself someone that just like, gets excited to like be on trains in general. Um, but <laughs> any any sort of but my enthusiasm about the jingles on said trains, I think, ties into a broader theme in my life where anytime music happens, I just sort of like take it in and absorb it for later. (laughs) And that's actually something that uh, I find very impressive about you is that it's a lot about what you pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Like I think that so much of your community building in on TikTok, if I may, like you may is granted. Oh yeah. (laughs) That was the most NPR thing I've ever done. (laughs) If, if I may. (laughs) So I think that like what is so interesting is that, some someone like us or like whatever who goes into TikTok or somebody there, you know, we're looking at we're looking at the musicians, we're looking at this or like whatever. But but you almost have like the you know the outsiders perspective or like the you know the outlier Malcolm Gladwell whatever <laughs> perspective on the thing where it's like when you come onto it, it's not about who's doing what on the app. It's about what you are finding interesting, mm. and because of that, you are able to come up with ideas or find things that might not be the most obvious. Thing. You know, obviously you got the musical stuff like like Can of Soup and, you know, mm-hmm. people like Charlie and, and, and whatnot. Um, but that's also how, you know, there's like Dan and and, and Hank um, mm-hmm. in, in your atmosphere. That's also mm-hmm. how you have what's Bus and Janelle <laughs> because of, you know, yeah. whatever. I just think I think that what's so interesting about you is like um, what you are paying attention to is extremely unique. And that's why I think your style and your collaborations are both unique and diverse. Thank you. I appreciate that. I feel like um, I, I do feel like sort of the the being selective about only kind of putting effort into things that I'm personally excited about. I, I do think it gives a more a level of integrity to the whole experience of like following my account, I guess. And I think so much of TikTok specifically 
is about kind of catching people's attention in the first few seconds and making them want to watch long enough to kind of like the video and hit the like button and share it. And then that makes things go viral. I feel like if you put a cons- if you are putting out content that is kind of consistently high quality, then it it makes your audience kind of trust you in the first few seconds and say like, oh, OK, I'm going to like keep watching and see where he's going with this. Uh, and then that leads to higher engagement and then you get uh, more viral videos, <laughs> I think. Yay, numbers, math, engagement. <laughs> Pausing the podcast to shout out our sponsor, New Wave. No, I've been drinking coffee my entire life. You know, as a, as a Roman, same. As a New Yorker, absolutely. It's our birthright. It's our birthright. We came out of the womb drinking coffee. Fully caffeinated. And the thing is, is that we're not getting any younger. That's true. And we're not getting any less anxious. Oh, man, that's true, too. I'll say I have loved coffee my whole life, but lately it hasn't really been agreeing with me. How so? Unfortunately, when I drink coffee now, I just start feeling very agitated, very anxious. I've been looking around for alternatives that don't make my heart beat out of my chest while I'm in the middle of working. And that's how we stumbled upon New Wave. New Wave's Flow State Coffee is an organic ground coffee meant to lower anxiety, improve brain function, and support creativity. With L-theanine and raw cacao, Flow State Coffee is meant to feel like a cup of hot chocolate or tea while giving the energy of coffee. And now, through Talking Lion, you can try a couple cups of your own. If you go to their website, newwave.co, that's N-O-O wave.co, you can use the code BREWINGLION for 10% off your first order. We hope you get a creative boost and find your flow state. Now, back to the show. When you came to visit, we were talking about, you're in Seattle? Yep, I'm in Seattle, Washington. The Emerald City. You were saying how, you know, you were in Seattle, you were doing software, um, which is what you studied in school, right? Kind of. I was homeschooled, actually. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's turn back the yeah. clock. Deep, Tell us deep about dive your, into your, Alex's childhood. Well. Give us your childhood. What traumatized you? Did you fall off the playground? Like, what's, <laughs> no. uh, Yeah, basically, my parents are both nerds and that program and, uh, And that's kind of why they moved out to Seattle initially and why I grew up in the area. And my mom was like the the like go to work parent. And then my dad was the stay at home parent. And I think and Hmm. I have a sister who you can see in the uh, family video that I just posted. And my sister and I early on when it was kind of we were kind of the age that we would be going, going to preschool or like a little bit before that. Then my dad, I think kind of got bored and just taught us stuff like how to count <laughs> to a hundred and stuff. Um, Cause why not? And then w- we turned out to be kind of, we, we sort of knew too much to be able to get the most out of like actual preschool. <laughs> and so I, th- I think the, the origin story is that my dad was just like, all right, I guess this is my life now. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and just went wow. for it. Uh, I think it's more complex than that, but, but that, that was kind of the initial thing. And then, so I was homeschooled for all of, elementary, middle school, high school, and college. How do you homeschool college? Not easily, um, but uh, (laughs) I mean, homeschooling isn't just about like, you know, your parent teaches you every single thing. It's more about like they find kind of different resources that you can use to kind of self-teach and they kind of guide you through it depending on the subject. So at one point, basically like Coursera and Udacity and and Udemy and all those websites kind of started happening right as I was entering kind of the like high school age. And when those websites first came out, a lot of their courses were about programming and free uh, because they like didn't (laughs) know if online college level courses were going to like work. They were like, hey, everyone can just do this for free. I was like, great, sign me up because I'm ready (laughs) to learn that. So I sort of kind of speed ran a like computer science education. And then I kind of just went into the um, industry pretty early. If you don't mind me asking, did you feel like homeschooling had any trouble on the social side? The only reason I ask is like, I don't think that my high school education was particularly like interesting though and I both did IB so that was fine like we definitely are educated etc but you know so much of high school was about like me and my my two friends and the antics that we kind of got up to did you find that not sort of interacting with folks your age in that like like hyper sort of compressed setting 
um, was mm. was tricky sort of as you got older? I don't know. A little bit. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I mean, there are some downsides to not being around kind of people your age like all the time. I did get some of that, though. There's sort of this, uh, there's this group called the Seattle Homeschool Group. Shout out to SHG that I was <laughs> in. That was kind of like a almost like a youth group for people that were also homeschooling. And so I, that was my friend group, basically. And so I definitely had friends that were my age, and they're awesome. That's awesome. And uh, my my friend Bailey, who was my childhood friend from that era, uh, he moved to New York, and uh, he's pursuing acting right now. And I said hi to him when I was in New York recently. So I was like, that's awesome. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Love to see it. Now, I guess yeah, the reason I asked is like, yeah, well, we, we threw the house show with Charlie and I, I, it was so interesting that you were like at, you know, at the party a little bit on the Shire side until somebody was like, do you want to play an instrument? And then you just <laughs> lit up and you just glue yeah. and like, yeah, like jamming. the whole, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was such a fun, you know, so fun jamming, like, you know, then the pre-show. I, I do, just, I do believe that, uh, making art, especially uh, like in music for me personally is like one of the most like kind of like intimate things you can like do with a friend uh like that like really speaks to me so like getting i i don't even need to necessarily have like a whole conversation with somebody if we can just like <laughs> just jam <laughs> well music is 100 percent a language yeah so it's really just a different kind of conversation <laughs> yeah yeah i i think that when we all got to jam before the show i think that it sort of like loosened up the whole party almost, you know, mm. just like made sure that everybody would like knew that they like everybody was looking out for each other, you know. Yeah. But uh, you know, I I I, I love that man. I, but that was just what, what I was asking because because that was the thing that I didn't realize until we had met that you are that you are a little bit like and and I don't not in a negative way, but you are a little bit on the uh, more introverted or like shyer side, mm. which you never can get when you see somebody on TikTok. Yeah. Like you don't necessarily realize that somebody might be introverted. Oh, I mean, fun fact about introversion. Um, I took the the Myers-Briggs test a few, like a few times throughout my life. And when I was like 12 and I took the Myers-Briggs test, I was an INTJ. And then when I took the test like a year ago, I was an ESFP. So like complete opposite. <laughs> Whoa. Interesting. Whoa. I, well, that, that. I mean, and I know and I have also on this on this show talked about our our issues with Myers Briggs and introverted versus extroverted and and the the god awful ambivert. Right. Uh, well like, what I like about Myers Briggs when you do it properly is that it's a spectrum. It's not it's not like you t- if you take the test, yeah, yeah. you don't just get you are introvert, you are expert. It is yeah, binary, and they you just get, give you, you are, the letters based on fall. kind of what, where, what side yeah, you're on. But there's definitely like a levels to it. But what I'm, what I'm, what I'm playing at is that like, uh, if somebody only knew Noah off of his TikTok, mm-hmm. they would know a Noah that I think I only really met oh after knowing him for three or four years, right. Because you are present, you are presenting the 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 most com- almost the most comfortable version of you. Yeah, because it's on your terms. In yeah, a sense. I exactly. actually I, I didn't um, I didn't watch uh, through Noah's TikTok account until like after I'd met him, and I was like, oh yeah, this is like different personalities <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, because uh, similarly, I think that N- N- Noah is like I mean less so than when we first met, but you're definitely more on the Shire yeah definitely. side, but. You wouldn't get that from his TikTok. Ironically, I'm extremely shy on TikTok. Mm. Yeah. Or extremely like mm. I hate putting out videos on TikTok. But I, you know, if you see me at, I mean, you saw me at the party. I'm just I'm buzzing around everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And my only my only viral TikTok is talking about the prisoner of Az- Azkaban. I believe that I believe that TikTok was actually pretty authentic to your personality. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most authentic. It was, so I guess I that's, that's a part win, of why I did so well. I guess so. Except for like every, every time I tell somebody this. They're like, man, you should have just like tagged your music <laughs> or something. But that here's the thing about TikTok. I'm I'm just gonna vent for a second that that, for that does not work. Like there there is there is n- that no one's gonna no one's no one scrolling through TikTok is gonna see something non music related. And if you say, oh, I do music too, there the crossover rate is near zero. Yeah, like like realistically, it, it no just one takes cares. so much effort to just like go find the thing they're talking about because TikTok doesn't let you like add links to anything. So yeah, um, exactly. It's just like no one actually wants to go through those clips. And, I, and I've seen the statistics. the 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 uh, The translation between a somewhat viral video and people clicking on your profile is also near zero. Mm. Maybe that differs for different kinds of creators. But like that's the thing, and you think I I totally understand it because the way I use TikTok, I've even you know, I, and I'm even being mindful of this and having coming from a sort of Instagram mindset. Still, very rarely when I see a piece of content I like, sometimes I follow, but very rarely do I click on their profile and go to watch other videos. Yeah. So then the idea of going to their, the only time I ever go to a link in bio is to stalk 
and see, oh, they have this many followers on TikTok. Does it translate yeah, to streaming? And the answer I click is on the links and bios to see what city people live in. <laughs> and that's basically right. it. Right. <laughs> I think I've accidentally sort of just like painted myself into a corner because on the one hand, I don't necessarily want to, you know, put our music or put my music or whatever on on TikTok and have this sort of like staged, I'm listening to it in the car and getting excited, mm -hmm. be how people, you know, come to our music. I'd rather people come to it with the level of authenticity that we present present it yeah. as well like that we bring to it you know on the other hand like i don't love doing trends i don't really want to do trends so i'm not going to do trends and and for what it's worth i'm a fucking new york jew so the thing that is most likely going to resonate with people is going to be me ranting about how yeah. uh you know time travel works in the harry potter <laughs> movies right yeah i'm very self i'm pretty self-conscious about um how my actual personality appears in videos like i don't I, I'm not sort of like an anxious to the point of like not wanting to, you know, reveal any any aspect of it or anything. I just think that it will get me less views if I sort of show how I actually <laughs> like genuinely emotionally like react to things just because I have so many different like social tics and whatever that um, like I don't. I don't not want people to see. I just feel like my video would be better if I just sort of like cleaned them out of the equation. Uh, and well, that, that was the thing too, is that like there is a coolness about your video, but there's also a coolness about how you are in real life. They're just two different kind of coolnesses, yeah. you know? Thank mm -hmm. you. You know, when I watch your videos, I, you know, I, I didn't know, like I was almost like, oh, he's like almost like too cool. Like I'm too <laughs> all over the place to like have a conversation with somebody so like mellow and cool. And then we meet and you and I are both talking at each other like a mile a minute, you know, <laughs> yeah. just like, like our brains are, yeah. you know, ticking and fluttering. Yeah, you know? I've, I've definitely... I've settled on a certain persona for sure. Like, like I do a lot of deadpan <laughs> stares in duets yeah. and stuff. <laughs> right. And the, honestly, the only reason I do that is because it feels like the easiest strategy. Um, like, I, I just, I'm not a good actor. And so if I tried to seem excited about something, but I have to do so many takes, then I would just become very ungenuine very, very fast. But if, if my only objective is to just do a deadpan stare and then play music well <laughs> while that's happening... That's a lot easier for me to accomplish, but also like get it done. You know what I'm saying? I I, to I totally get that. I, I feel uh, I was gonna say I, I feel very similarly about uh about Charlie too. Like when I see his TikToks, they are oh like they're so cool. Like he's yeah, such Charlie a, is I mean, he's insane. Objectively, um, a, a cool guy. I have to guy, return the favor on... because Charlie talked about me a lot, so I have to now talk about Charlie <laughs> at least like for yeah. I mean, this could be the um, this could be the Charlie the Charlie segment. But he's so cool. But but the thing is that when we like hang out, he is not the you know sort of mellow person that you would necessarily expect mm. he is as like talkative as we are like all of us talking is just like these like this fast rapid fire sort of thing and it's just it is it was so interesting to me because the you know people who I'm like oh you know maybe I'm too much for them or like whatever we're all just a lot we just everybody's kind of good at editing where they are you know yeah i've been i'm really impressed well everything charlie does is really impressive he's he's a he's amazing and i think that the persona that he cultivates on his channel I think is really impressive like I, I don't want to sound like I think that everyone's like channel is like you know this like fake sham that isn't no, I them think, I think it's, it's authentic but, but it's you like can be authentic I, I get and genuinely also, impressed yeah, yeah. like in a like I'm genuinely impressed when I see someone that's able to put out a lot of content where they're clearly filming lots of takes of themselves and then editing it together but they seem like this sort of coherent person after all of that uh, because I've tried to do that and it's really, really hard. I think he's he's seamlessly funny and clever, but also just has so much musicality about what he does. Uh, we were saying on his episode that we like found him because he was doing all, like odd time signature stuff. And we mm -hmm. had a similar feeling that we felt about your stuff, which is like, this is somebody who has spent so much time in the theater thick of it mm -hmm. <laughs> um not to make a tiktok joke on that too but into the thick of it <laughs> you know they uh yeah like Char charlie is just like he's got the hours under his belt so he just he's able to seamlessly make this stuff or, or we know it's not like like i we know firsthand that it, that it does take a lot of effort on his part but he does make it look so seamless and yeah. so easy. It makes it look like he's freestyling. Yeah. He has a really know? great sense of humor too, where he 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 adds just the right amount of like kind of add just the right amount of humor to kind of make you uh, yeah. to, to kind of um make things seem authentic but without making that the whole thing. 
And it's like, it's really about this amazing music that he made, but he adds a little sprinkle. I, I remember, of I remember talking to him that, that he, he makes a very important point of having his music not be comedy mm-hmm. music. That that's like, that's a line that to him, he, he is like very mm-hmm. intentional about not crossing that he can have humor in his music, but especially on TikTok mm-hmm. that he's not making comedy music. Yeah. That makes it that I think, I, yeah. I think is, I think is just an interesting perspective. Yeah. He's also a community builder. Like, I think one of the things that we appreciate, you know, was that he did want to have a house show for his birthday. Like, that he does mm-hmm. cultivate his community on TikTok and culti- and, and since moving to LA, has cultivated his community here and has, you know, has been so generous about, like, linking friends together and all that stuff, too. And, you know, and he, and he hops on a dolly track. He comes by to record with us. Like, you know, he's just... You know, like he he cares about people so genuinely, um, mm-hmm. and you know, sometimes he'll just call and be like, you know, like miss you. Was thinking about you. Like that that's the kind of guy he is. He is really supportive I think, of everybody he knows, and it's like makes me really happy to be his friend. Oh my god, I I feel so so grateful and lucky because I like we were fans first. Like I think that like the fact that we are like friends means the world and the, and his his support has been so inspiring to us Pausing the podcast to remind you that we have a Patreon that you can subscribe to if you want to support the show. If you're enjoying this episode, but you're thinking that you've got a burning question for an artist, or you just want to talk with us, or maybe you just want to mug with our faces, our Patreon's the way to go. So go to patreon.com slash talking lion to subscribe. Now back to the show. He also very enthusiastically jumped on board my, the very first episode of Lightning Collabs. One, two, three. Lightning Collabs, Lightning Collabs, making art with my friends, but it's really fast. Today's episode, Charlie Curtis Beard. And that was a lightning collab. Lightning with, collabs. Right. Lightning, lightning collabs. collabs. Lightning collabs. Making art with my friends because it's really fast. Or, but it's really fast. Uh, and that show is literally just about making fun of everybody that's on the show. And but he still wanted to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that I was I was really happy about that. No, I I, I appreciate. It. I love I love the lightning collabs too. Because again, making art with your friends. There's nothing better. Yeah, I I, I think I'm on 13 episodes or 14 episodes of that. Um, and I might do like a season two at some point, but the idea of that was really just because I want, I love making collabs. Like that's the thing I like doing the most. And, uh, just like appearing on someone else's video or having them appear in my video. And it just, it makes the fans so happy. It makes me really happy. Um, that's the best, but the hardest part of collabs is finding an idea to do. Like everyone's, <laughs> right. I have so many ongoing DM threads with like people that I became mutual. So it's like, hey, it would be great to do a collab at some point. And then the conversation just stops there because n- neither of us have like a good idea of something that we could do that like involves each other. And so I was just kind of thinking to myself how like so this has happened to me so many times. And I was thinking like, what if I just make it a bit that like I'm, I just speed run through as many collabs as possible with my friends that I just haven't done a collab with yet. But the joke is that like it's the most underwhelming collab you've ever seen. <laughs> I, and I think that, that that's where some of the genius lies. Like I think that um, the big secret is that I am I I, I think I'm cr- like creatively lazy. Um, I, you know, I have like good ideas like every couple months or so or whatever. Mm-hmm. But you know, you're you're talking to, to folks who have eighty plus episodes of a podcast mm-hmm. that was born out of <laughs> that. I want to collaborate with a lot of friends. But I didn't want to have to come up with a song every time we wanted to collaborate. I didn't want to have to, you know, come up with an idea every time we collaborated. Yeah. This is just, we talk. The name is Talking Lion. Really <laughs> w- wonder how we got to that one, you know? And and then all the art is just their faces. Done. Finished. Easy. No, yeah. Like, I respect, <laughs> I, wanna, I, I, I respect coming up with a series that is an excuse to, like, collab with people. Because <laughs> that's what I did. Right. <laughs> Well, and that, and that's that's what I'm playing at is that like when you find a way, I think, and Noah and I have talked about this with TikTok is like I think the hardest thing to do is to come up with great ideas consistently. Yeah, and I think that like I am so jealous of some of the popular TikTok accounts that I follow mm-hmm. where it's just one idea that is just constantly interesting. Like I follow a. It's, I think is called the treadmill guy. Oh, the treadmill guy. <laughs> and what he does is, so he like puts a bunch Same of like out. toy cars on a treadmill 
and then races them. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Like, I've seen that. Yeah, but that's that's all the content that it is. I, I'm like, I love that. I think that's amazing. I think there was one like, I wish... that was like a bunch of like USPS mail trucks versus a bunch of like <laughs> military tanks or something. And I got right. and the mail trucks yeah, won. The mail trucks won. I got won. so invested watching that, and I got really excited when the mail trucks won. <laughs> uh, I was yeah. I I we get invested in all of them, but I just you know that's the thing is that I feel like. Where I always get sort of stunted in in TikTok land is that like, you know, I'll have an idea, you know, I want to execute it. Then I'll be like, well, fuck now. Every time I execute an idea, I need another idea. And then I get overwhelmed. And then when I get overwhelmed, I don't do things for four months. And then that's just kind of how it goes, mm. you know. So, yeah, I, I think that like when you can find something that's consistent, I just don't like having guesswork. I don't like having to have to come mm. up with things every time, you know. There's a reason that like our intro is somewhat formulaic. There's a reason why yeah. some of the things that we do is somewhat formulaic. It's just because we need to be able to plug and play as much yeah, as possible because otherwise I'll be creatively drained by the end of the day yeah. or a week or whatever, you know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Making things easy for the people you're working with is definitely like kind of the trade secret of making a lot of collabs. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, I think, although for me, I actually really like when I actually have to like put in some creative energy or like record a bunch of stuff um, because it it feels like, I, I like doing both, right? I like sort of just showing up as like a cameo and something because that's just r really funny <laughs> to me. Like it, it feels good to be at, the pl at a big enough platform that I could just do that and that's funny to people. Uh, but also I think that I, I also am totally game if people are like, hey, I want to, I have kind of this shell of a thing um, and it, could you like add something to this? And then I like figure something out and that's really, really fun to me. Partly because <laughs> I don't have anything else going on as a musician so I can just spend time on things like that. But other people cannot do that because they have like cool musician stuff to do all the time. And so uh, <laughs> I try to make things uh, pretty bite-sized. Uh, like my, my 200K <laughs> celebration as one example. I was like, I mean, I, so I love that. That was so good. That was a really pleasant surprise um, to put together because I, I really, I literally only asked my, my friends to just send me a video of them singing the chorus so I could do the montage. But then people unprompted we, who, that were instrumentalists were like, hey, here's an instrument track that I recorded. <laughs> and then a bunch of horn people that I, that uh, I'm mutuals with were like, I love to add horns to this. Um, and so I wrote out a horn part after the fact, like while I was working on it and I sent it to them and then they recorded it. I think that the trick when you're doing something like that is that you sort of create an assignment, but you make it possible to break that assignment. Um, and then yeah. like, and then if you're, if then people have the opportunity to be like, Hey, like I see a different way this could go. Um, and if they're excited about it, that's probably means that it's going to be like a better idea. Uh, and so like letting, letting the, I love when that happens when I'm working on something and then someone's like, hey, I just gave you a bunch of this stuff. And I, I think that it is to a degree like indicative of what what, you know, all of our careers have been so far, too, is that like I know what what I what my plan was compared to how the talent of my friends have changed that plan. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, we're just embodying that in a song. You're embodying that in a video, you know, like being able to trust that our friends have us like they always have, you know, that kind of thing. What drew you to, to making TikToks? Because, mm. you know, boredom. as... as <laughs> Boredom. Uh, uh, a little pandemic, have you heard yeah, of it? Yeah. I, uh, so my the thing that I usually did but as my artistic thing before TikTok... I I am I think I mentioned this to you already, but I uh, I am a like musical director for improv comedy shows, uh, where I right, will show I right. did I just did one yesterday actually um, at uh, Unexpected Productions. Shout out to Unexpected Productions uh, in Pike Place Market in Seattle. But uh, I'm like a like a resident musician and also show up play keyboard. Um, and then just like add background music to all the scenes and then add accompaniment to all the improvised songs as well. Um, and I've been doing that for three years. That feels so challenging. I mean, like improv comedy is challenging. Like improvising music is challenging, but improvising comedy music, it feels impossible to me. Uh yeah, it, it took it took a. And that's somebody bit like I have a background in both. Yeah. Like I have a background in music and a background in improv, and I'm like, no, I can't. That yeah. would be yeah, it, way too hard. I've been for doing me. it for about three years, and it was kind of scary to kind of get into it. But I I sort of knew like I I always loved watching Who's Line as a kid, and so right. I had always kind of thought in the back of my mind like being Laura Hall basically would be really fun in that being that role in a show like that would be really fun, but it just seemed really impossible to me. But then. I think all the skills I have make me kind of well equipped for that particular job where I sort of have 
I'm kind of a jack of all trades, master of none, in that like the technique of any given better than master of one, you yeah. know. <laughs> the the technique of any given instrument I play is not really it's kind of mid tier at best. Uh, but the but <laughs> but I have a well rounded enough understanding of so many different instruments and genres that I can kind of show up and approximate something really fast, and that works really well for improv contexts. And that's been really fun. And it, I keep doing it because it allows me to kind of be on the same level as like really awesome comedians in my area. <laughs> and like I'm now up here with like really talented comedy and music people. Uh, and I'm kind of a supporting role. And then they look up to me as the supporting role. And so it's like really it was really fun to get involved in that scene. And I am probably going to keep doing that indefinitely because, you know, just because I have a platform on TikTok now doesn't mean I get the same joy of like live performance that I did when I was like actually playing in shows. So I'm I'm totally going to keep doing improv shows. You tell me you're not going to do live lightning collabs. <laughs> I'm not. Although TikTok. It's, it's a 30 second show that. <laughs> like going back to how I got into TikTok, I was doing that. And then, you know, pandemic happened. All improv went away and we started doing some remote, like basically Zoom prov. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, improv stopped. We were doing Zoom prov. Wasn't really the same. We tried, especially musical improv with the latency. It's just literally impossible. And I, I sort of had a TikTok account, but hadn't posted anything. And I was like, I don't know. A, a lot of things that I've done creatively have been the result of like seeing people succeed at things that I could totally also do and then just doing <laughs> right. it. And so I saw some people on TikTok that were making videos that are like, the thing that really drew me in and the thing I thought that was going to be my thing was kind of like doing songs in other genres. Uh, and taking a song right. and doing like, hey, here's a montage of that song in many different genres. And so I saw some people doing that. And I feel like one of my special skills is having a really deep understanding of a lot of different genres enough to be able to transform one genre into another. So I was like, I could totally be the guy that's like making Turing songs in other genres. It turned out that I don't have enough of a steady stream of ideas to be constantly making that content. But a couple of my best videos follow that format, which I was really proud about like a uh, final countdown in the style of seven genres, but each genre is weirdly specific. That was my tip because people had already done the so and so in seven genres before, but I wanted to put an extra spin on it where it's all the genres are weirdly specific. And you had never really thought about that being a musical genre before until this moment. Uh, and so that was fun to to do. But that's what drew me in. I saw some people that were making this like music content that I was like, I could totally do that. And then what what made me the, the Bill Wirtz adjacent content is what made me convinced that I had at least one like good skill that people actually <laughs> Avenue, wanted to see. Yeah. Because the first Bill Wirtz ish video I posted was All Star, but in the style of Bill Wirtz, I think. Somebody once told me the world was gonna roll me. I ain't the sharpest tool in the shed. He was looking kinda dumb with her finger in her thumb in the shape of an L on her forehead. Right. <laughs> I think um, I remember that I think Kira interacted with that and followed me because of that. Um, which felt good. I think she sent us that video. I think that was like <laughs> um, the first thing that she found. That, too, so. that video was actually recycled content, basically, because uh, <laughs> two years ago, like prior to that, me posting that I had done just the audio of that TikTok in like I, I was using like Reaper at the time on some random laptop. So I still don't I don't have the session. Of course, file. you're using Reaper. Of course, I don't, of course I don't have the session Reaper. file anymore of that anymore because I um, uh, but I literally like I posted it on Instagram and the video was just like a screen cap of Reaper playing the song. Uh, it's lowest effort possible. Maybe like a hundred of my friends saw it and thought it was like, haha, nice job. Good job. Um, but I was kind of proud of it. And and I was like looking at 
I felt like I was a pretty solid musician and musical comedian, but all of the energy I had spent so far was in live shows that weren't like persisted anywhere. So I was thinking like, what are all of the things that I've done that I could actually like post on TikTok and people <laughs> would might like and then like it go viral. And I remembered that two years ago, I posted that on Instagram. I didn't have the files anymore. It was on an old computer. So I just downloaded <laughs> it off of Instagram again and then used that as an audio and then filmed just a really quick little video of me lip syncing to my own thing and then posted that. <laughs> and then it that... It, it like didn't, I don't know, it got like maybe 100,000 views. So like nothing like astronomical, but I was like, holy crap, but that, there's but, a market But those 100,000 are all very specific, uh, specific fans. Exactly. Very specific so I, I definitely like, reached the target audience. It's the Billworths for your and page. And so uh, yeah. I was like, all right, Billworths content is the angle here. So I then made, uh, right. uh, I did the uh, Five Feet Apart, but because the, uh, they're not gay, Vine in the style of Bill Words. Feet apart. Beep, 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 yeah. beep, beep. I was really proud of the synth solo in that one. Hey, look, it's two bros chilling in a hot tub. Five feet apart. Five feet apart. Wait, why are they five feet apart? Because they're not <laughs> and that, and I was like, all right, I'm I'm now going to start making fresh Bill Wirtz content that like is original. So I I started I did that, and that got mega viral. It got me my first like twenty thousand followers, I think, from like zero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was like, all right, uh, and so and then I did one more in that series where I did I think Roadwork Ahead in the style of Bill Wirtz. Roadwork Ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I sure hope it does. And then I was like, right, I have run out nice. of ideas. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then a co- some of my fans were mildly disgruntled that I did not post any more Bill Wirtz content after that point because I made it look like that I was going to keep doing that. Uh, right. But, uh, oh, well, they got they got some quality unrelated content anyway. So this is my formal pitch for you to do. They were roommates. They were roommates in the style of Bill Wirtz. All right. Uh, I can probably do that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um what what uh other than doing they were roommates um and this is my my last question is what's your plan from here like i know that's a sometimes a terrible question but like what what are you what's your aim like what are you hoping for you know uh move like in the next year or so or whatever um i don't know i think i would really like to release music at some point i like but i don't know if i'm actually gonna be able to commit enough time to actually finishing it so calling it a goal feels like I'm setting myself up for failure. But that is that's the dream <laughs> is to put out like an EP of music that I really like. Well, hey, if you if you need need Hell help, yeah. let us know. Uh, that's our whole thing. I'll uh, we'll talk you through the business. We'll talk you through the production. We'll do we'll yeah. uh, we'll, we'll be there for you, but you know, because that's our thing. I appreciate you know? that. I will absolutely hit you up. And until until then, I'll, I'll keep playing the game of like how many cool people I can impress by posting stupid stuff on TikTok. Because that's a fun, <laughs> that's great, a, an enjoyable great game. game to play for me. Uh, <laughs> well, we we appreciate that a lot. We appreciate the community that you built around the fun that you're having. You know, like we appreciate. That I do you've, feel you've like brought- I, I, I pre- and not to toot my own horn, but that is like one of the things that I'm most proud of of my time on TikTok is that I've like, yeah, um, I've sort of brought some people together and made them want to collab with each other, which makes me happy. And you, you, you have, and like you are, you know, you are, like I said, the the, the thing that connects so many different people in, in our world. I'm glad that you got to experience some of that while you were out here mm-hmm. and like on your travels and stuff as well. You, you got a good heart for this. If you wind up being a capital A artist, you know, <laughs> more power to you because your heart's in the right place for it. And we, we, yeah, we look forward to <laughs> everything that comes out of your brain because you're, you're such an interesting and funny and unique guy. And it's just, we're, we're very grateful to be uh, your friend. So thank you so much for being on the show, man. I'm glad to finally have you here. <laughs> uh, I, appreciate everything you just said uh it was really fun to be on this uh podcast i'm glad we finally found a a time to make it happen Thank you for listening to this episode of Talking Lion. We would like to thank New Wave, The Truffleist, and Isotope for their support of Talking Lion. If you'd like to show your support, ask our guests your questions, talk to us on Discord, and get a shout out at the end of each episode, subscribe to our Patreon over at patreon.com slash talkinglion. Thank you for listening and see you next time.